Tonight on Denver 7 News at 6, evacuations are ordered after a tractor trailer slams into a natural gas line. It is the people's house. Lawmakers want a fence in the state capitol. We're going 360. We believe that it's necessary to protect not only the building, but the visitors and the people who work here. I would not like it. The market is hot for high rises, and that means the entire block of bars and restaurants could get the wrecking ball. There's so much history here, but, you know, change is inevitable. I think that sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> Plus a statewide push to pool money for teachers. If we ignore the situation that's happening with our, our educator workforce, uh, we're, we're going to be in a world of hurt. Ballerina gives specifics on how many fans can watch the Avs and Nuggets play in person. We feel that now the, the time is right. The Broncos part ways with Philip Lindsay. And we hop on the magic bus. I'm super educated. <laughs> and we begin tonight with breaking news out of Weld County where a semi truck caught fire after smashing into a natural gas line. Now we have just learned the driver somehow got himself to the hospital on his own. The extent of his injuries unknown. And this is happening Weld County Road 29 and 72. This is just west of Eden. Evacuations have been ordered within a one mile radius of that, and we will bring you updates just as soon as we get them. Well, Colorado lawmakers on both sides of the aisle have decided a fence is the best way to protect our state capital, and they did it without telling anyone. In fairness, their safety is at the heart of the matter, but it's also the people's house, and it seems like the people deserve to know what's happening on their front lawn. Denver 7's Lance Hernandez spent the better part of the day just trying to get someone to give him some details, and Lance begins our 360 coverage. Lance? Well, Shannon, it's not a done deal yet, but there is bipartisan support on the committees responsible for the Capitol to enhance security. So they're looking at a fence, bulletproof glass here on the ground floor, and more cameras. We have reviewed multiple proposals and we have not settled on any of them yet. The chair of the Capital Development Committee says none of the proposals would obstruct the view. They're all open, they're wrought iron. Um, all of them have uh, the four main entrances of the building completely unobstructed. Representative Edie Hooten says a fence is necessary to protect the building from vandals and potential looters. Residents we talked with outside the Capitol have mixed emotions. I just think it takes away people's freedom to move around. I think the tax dollars that would go towards the fence around the building would be a one-time thing and it would prevent further spending to uh, repair vandalism. Years ago, there used to be a fence around the Capitol. Uh, that was taken down during the World War because they needed that metal for production. Senator Jerry Sonnenberg says he doesn't want to see access limited, but he wants to make sure people who work in the basement are safe. No one is sharing any renderings yet, but Sonnenberg says he favors a proposal which would circle the Capitol inside the inner ring sidewalk with a six foot tall fence. We went to Denver Police Headquarters and to the Mint to see what their wrought iron fences look like. Sonnenberg says he's heard an estimate of one to two million dollars for the enhanced security, which he calls exorbitant. I can tell you if it's going to be a, per, uh, a permanent iron fence, I got a bunch of ranchers up in northeastern Colorado that can build that fence for much cheaper. Some former lawmakers are pushing back against the fence idea. Former House Speaker Terrence Carroll told me that in this environment, people don't trust their government. That's a problem for democracy. A fence exacerbates that. No timeline being issued on when a final decision will be made. And Representative Hooten told me that a fence won't require a vote by the entire legislature. She says the Capitol Building Advisory Committee approves the design and the Executive Committee has final say on any changes to the Capitol itself or to the Capitol grounds. Lance Hernandez. Denver 7. Right, thank you, Lance. And there is actually an argument to be made that building a fence could save the state money in the long run. Now, last year's protest resulted in 112 shattered windows and doors there at the Capitol, also at the eight surrounding auxiliary buildings. 11 security cameras were smashed, eight gates were damaged, and three flagpoles were broken. Monuments, we recall, also were toppled, and there was graffiti everywhere. And the final price tag to clean all that up $1 million. There are some insurance policies that will cover certain elements of what's gone on. Uh, but ultimately, um, ultimately, it's state taxpayer dollars that cover the cost of this kind of damage and this kind of cleanup. 
Now, some believe the vandalism forced lawmakers to confront the issue of police brutality head on. Others think it was nothing more than a distasteful, wasteful distraction. Regardless of which side you're on, there is no arguing last year's session was a productive one. The police accountability law passed by the legislature was one of the most ambitious in the country. The bill banned the use of chokeholds, eliminated the qualified immunity defense, and made body cameras a requirement for all law enforcement officers. Well, just this week, the acting House Sergeant at Arms informed Congress that that fencing will be scaled back. This is the U.S. Capitol. Republicans don't like it. Democrats don't like it. The public doesn't like it. It. Pretty much everybody in Washington seems to agree there are other ways to protect the people's house. Now, that said, everyone pretty much agrees that fence made sense for the short term. After all, the Colorado State Capitol sustained property damage. The U.S. Capitol was the site of an armed invasion. So now it's your turn. Are you okay with a six-foot fence around the Capitol if it keeps vandals away? Do you think there's another maybe less unsightly way of handling security? Tell us about it with an email to 360 at the denverchannel.com. And if there's a perspective you think we missed, tell us about that too. A bill to bolster the salaries of Colorado teachers advanced out of a Senate committee today. Now, this is not an across the board raise. Instead, it establishes a fund that districts and charter schools can pull from. Now, State Senator Rachel Zenzinger, a teacher herself, by the way, says something has to be done to ensure that educators don't leave Colorado for greener pastures. Already before COVID, we had a 3,000 teacher shortage in Colorado, and, and now we are looking at the possibility of 40% of our teachers thinking about quitting or retiring. And that 40% figure comes from a recent Colorado survey by the Colorado Education Association. A report from the Colorado School Finance Project found our teachers are paid roughly $8,000 below the national average. Westminster police are promising an aggressive approach toward investigating bias-motivated crimes against Asian Americans. The chief said he believes those crimes are currently underreported. We're here today to build the bridges with our community and ask that they help us in investigating and intervening. That dialogue and that level of trust takes time. It takes effort. You know, there may be some steps backwards. But that's OK. You know, the the level of effort to try to reach out is ultimately what will change that picture. Six of eight people murdered in a rampage this week in Atlanta were of Asian descent. Police said today the investigation is early on and classifying this as a hate crime is not off the table. Shipments were delayed by the snow, but 324,000 doses of the vaccine eventually arrived in Colorado this week. Nearly 20,000 of them are to be allocated to community sites. The state health department says three out of four Coloradans now 65 and older have had at least one dose of the vaccine. The Denver Sheriff's Department has only five cases of coronavirus right now, the lowest number since the pandemic started, and no deaths. The department just released a report on the year of dealing with a pandemic, and the sheriff told me he's pleased with how the department stepped up by quickly changing health protocols for staff and inmates. He also defended the decision to release some people early. It was important for us to make sure that the folks that we were releasing were, were not threats to the community so we released low level offenders those that were eligible for personal recognizance bonds those that were medically vulnerable uh pregnant women those that had comorbid morbidities uh and so for us it was about ensuring that we thought about public safety while also ensuring that we only had the people that were in custody that were absolutely necessary during the pandemic and you will see more of my conversation with Denver Sheriff Diggins tonight on Denver 7 News at 10. An entire block within Denver's Governor's Park neighborhood could be bulldozed to make way for apartment buildings. Denver 7's Gary Broad has a story from Grant and 7th. Gary, this area has already gone through several changes over the last year. You ain't lying there, Shannon. Yeah, race scenes, which was the first place I ever visited here in Denver. That closed early on in the pandemic. Same goes for Max's, which is right next to it. Even our own building right now is in the process of being sold, and that's just down the street as well. And now the newest one, this building behind me, it's 110 years old. Really one of the character builders here in Cap Hill is on the chopping block. Change is inevitable, especially in Denver, but it still leaves a bad taste in the mouths of some. Losing part of our, our character and part of our soul, um, and I don't know exactly what we're gaining by it.
the end of February, a certificate of demolition eligibility was filed for 701 and 711 North Grant Street. Locations where bars and restaurants like Vesper Lounge, Mizuno, Luca, and Lou's Food Bar have called home for years. Frank Bonanno leases the space for all four restaurants. He tells Denver 7 the owner of the building wants to sell. We also discovered there are those who plan to fight the demolition over historic designation. It's heartbreaking a little bit, but you know, with what we've been through in the past year, what could surprise you? While he could technically be kicked out 90 days after the process is complete, Bonanno believes he has at least a couple of years before it's time to go. While he spent a majority of his life building up this block of eateries, the restaurant and bar owner is concerned for the future of his 100 employees and the place he's helped mold. I've been invested in this neighborhood for 20 years, so I mean, I, I've obviously opened four businesses in this neighborhood because I love this neighborhood. I love the character of this neighborhood. Our own building, Denver 7, which was built in the late 60s, is also being sold, and the new owners are similarly looking to replace the building that is here. And just like 701 and 711 North Grand Street, there is a group trying to stop that, saying the current building should be designated as a historic landmark. I think it makes sense in a way that, like, people do follow the money with things. Um, so making, like, a big high-rise here is probably going to generate more money than the restaurants do, but... There also needs to be restaurants and places to hang out. A Bonanno tells me he has tried numerous times to buy the building, but he and the owner can never come to an actual agreement. Uh, as for that application for a historic landmark, that's now going to be a 60-day process where those who did apply for it have to plead their case. Uh, as for the owner of the building, we did reach out to the sermon agency for comments, but have not heard back. Reporting live here in Cap Hill, Gary Broad, Denver 7. As of April 2nd, Ball Arena will be allowed to host up to 4,000 people for Avs and Nuggets games. Fans are pumped, players can't wait, but it's vendors who have the most reason to be excited. It's been years sitting around and, and, and trying to get Uncle Sam to do what's right for us, trying to get, get back to work. We want to be back and we want to give you the experiences that you guys deserve, that you paid for. And we are more than anxious to get back and do that for you. Oh boy, we are looking forward to seeing you too. And while the general public won't be allowed in until April, frontline workers and first responders will be in the stands to see the Nuggets play on March 30th and the Avs on March 31st.